Anywhere else in the world, this would be considered a mountain. Here, it's only a small peak in the canyon. The history of the Grand Canyon extends far back through inconceivable spans of time. It has brooded in northern Arizona for 10 million years. Its modern history began with discovery by the Spaniard Coronado in 1540. His lieutenant, Cardenas, came to the canyon and looked down on it without realizing its immensity. He thought the river was about six feet wide. In fact, it averages about 300. The first European man to explore the length of the canyon was Major John Wesley Powell. Major Powell was a veteran of the Civil War and had lost his right arm in the Battle of Shiloh. Major Powell prepared for his journey of exploration by having four small boats constructed. The U.S. Army furnished food, enough for one year, mostly coffee, beans, and flour. A chair was fixed to the top of one of the boats so Powell could see ahead at all times. It seems likely Major John Wesley Powell may have been the first human of any race to explore the length of the canyon. More than once, I have been warned by the Indians not to enter the canyon. They considered it disobedience to the gods and contempt for their authority and believed that it would surely bring upon me their wrath. In May of 1869, his small party of 10 men left Green River, Wyoming to begin this epic journey into the great unknown, as Powell called it. The boats were often swamped and the men thrown overboard as they ran the rapids. One boat and much of their food and supplies was lost before even reaching the Grand Canyon. In each accident, more food was lost. The boats needed constant repair. It was the Major's habit to explore around the river when the men stopped to camp. Climbing a cliff, he was unable to go back and had to be rescued by one of his men who pulled him up by his long underwear. After 13 weeks, Powell emerged from the canyon, eventually propelled to national prominence by his feat of exploration. He was able to fill in what had been a huge blank space in U.S. maps at that time. Now, the northwest corner of Arizona was better understood. Grand Canyon National Park clings to the course of the Colorado River as it slices through this corner of what is now Arizona. The nearest city is Flagstaff. It's probably the greatest natural wonder in North America. Even the statistics are staggering. A winding trip through the canyon by water is 277 miles. Major Powell had been the first to traverse the river through Grand Canyon. There were other attempts afterwards. Most failed. Two who did not fail were the Cobb brothers. They came to know the canyon perhaps better than anyone else. In 1911, the Cobb brothers started down the Colorado River in small boats. Their purpose was to photograph the scenic richness of the canyon. Their boats were also battered, needed repair. They discovered a mysterious skeleton that could not be identified. Only a 1900 issue of the Los Angeles Times was found with it. They were two young men when they came out west from Pittsburgh in 1901. They opened a photographic business to support themselves and immediately immersed themselves in the canyon. They explored inaccessible areas, often risking their lives. 
They labored for days to get a single photo. They were the first to make moving pictures of the Grand Canyon. In 1914, National Geographic devoted one complete issue to the Cobb brothers' pictures. They traveled widely and lectured about the Grand Canyon they loved. Emery Cobb spent the rest of his life here. Explorer, photographer, lecturer, river runner. He embraced the spirit of this canyon. He remains here, still. For thousands of years, other human eyes have looked on these scenes, surveyed these vistas, but from a different point of view. European man looked at this as a landscape to be conquered. The American Aborigine sought to become part of it, to become one with it. Winter was for them the most difficult time. Those ancient hunter-gatherers are gone. But the primitive rhythms still seem near the surface here, here on the rim of the Grand Canyon. The rhythm of the seasons still pulses deep in the winter storms that rise, that bloom and blow out over the canyon. In April, the last of the snow disappears from the rims. And finally, from the forest further back. The natural world seems to pause and gather itself, waiting with drawn breath for the eruption of spring. Before the air becomes too warm along the edge of the canyon, canyon lizards pick ants from juniper trees. A nearby raven prowls the canyon edge, searching too for breakfast. Even the warmth-loving lizard will die if his body temperature reaches 104 degrees. These little lizards display a singular intelligence, alert, active, he seems to do push-ups for his morning exercise. Actually, it's an aggressive behavior related to mating. The buzzing cicadas make the spring air vibrate with their own rituals of survival and propagation. He looks like a feast the lizards can't resist. When the lizard misses the cicada, the raven is able to see it and snatches it in mid-flight.
the liquid days of spring now spill over canyon walls like a waterfall, propelling flowers into bloom. Up on the rim, the first lonely lupines bloom on the forest floor. Suddenly, almost overnight it seems, they will overlay the ground like a blue carpet. This seems a world apart from the canyon, but it too is a part of Grand Canyon National Park. An astonishingly bright world. The vagrant flowers flash in endless variety. The plants exude sweetness and draw in other life. The insects come to feed. It's a symbiotic relationship. The feeding of the insect ensures the propagation of the plant. Bees carry pollen on their hind legs from plant to plant, fertilizing the ones that couldn't survive without it. Hummingbirds also come to these flowers, these natural feeders. The rufous hummingbird is common. He is a flying machine of incomparable sophistication, able to fly in any direction, even backwards. He can hover with the body absolutely fixed in space, as though welded there on some invisible steel rod. This is made possible by wings that pulsate at 80 beats per minute. No man-made aircraft has ever achieved such maneuverability. The Uinta chipmunk makes his entrance as the tiny clown of the forest. He's a plentiful resident of the Ponderosa pine forest. They feed on grasses and seeds and may eat as much food as the deer. He scurries around in trees, sometimes looking for bird eggs, even though he's primarily a vegetarian because they're most active in the early morning hours, their sheer number may not be apparent. The blue grouse prowls the cool forest this morning. She hunts with her family, searching for flowers. She can make a blossom disappear as quickly as a magician. The chicks are still learning this game and don't quite know what to do. They are heavy birds, not good flyers, so they're sometimes easy prey for coyotes. On the Kayabab Plateau on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, a series of pleasant meadows break up the forest at irregular intervals. They are ancient breeding grounds for many insect species, particularly grasshoppers. In midsummer, the grasshoppers may number dozens per square yard. And now they provide a banquet for forest dwellers, attracting coyotes, herons, and turkeys. Birds are expected to feed on insects, but the coyote makes them a substantial part of his summer diet. Fat crickets are even more appetizing to him. Sometimes the swarming grasshoppers become an irritant. In fact, they even bother the heron, crawling up one leg, then the other. The possibility of a turkey dinner can still divert the coyote's interest. But he's probably full of grasshoppers. He doesn't put much effort into the chase. The Harris hawk flies the skies of Arizona. The service he performs is one of check and balance, 
a check on the rabbit and rodent populations. He wouldn't be called Old Never Miss. But in order to survive, he has to be good. The rabbit weighs about the same as the hawk, pretty evenly matched. But more often than not, the rabbits usually escape. just feeding himself in the only way nature has provided him. magical experience in the summer forest. The vibrant dynamics of the forest can reach the very core of your soul, that peace that passeth understanding, a celebration of life. On the North Rim, at Greenland Lake, deer feed on water plants, an unusual thing to see. In other places, moose often eat in the water like this, submerging their heads to get plants on the bottom of the lake, but rarely ever deer. As the deer monitor their environment for any signs of danger, it's easy to see where they've gotten their name mule deer. Big ears enable them to pick up faint sounds, sounds far beyond the range of human hearing. Even though they are protected in this national park setting, they are cautious. There are still cougars or mountain lions in these forests. And cougars are still the main natural enemy of the mule deer, even though their numbers are few. The aspen forests are full of energy now. The wandering birds settle in for a few frenzied weeks to raise families. Some aspen trees may seem like bird hotels. Three nests are within eight feet of each other in this grove. The adults ignore each other as they obey their instincts to tend their young. Bluebirds make trip after trip to the meadow to collect insects. They return to the nest every five or six minutes with another catch. The birds now launch an incredible assault on insect populations. The insects will survive, but without the birds, their numbers would expand beyond belief. In these wind-scarred spaces, solitude 
is the nurturing element. For some visitors, the reason for coming to this place. Solitude is a precious quality, even here in Grand Canyon. But there are still secret places where a hiker can test his ability to spend some time alone, some time in his own company. He carries in his pack two gallons of water. Without it, he risks death. A lonely hike often affords the most intimate experience with the natural world for those who seek it. A glimpse at the private life of a family of nesting birds somehow seems a rare privilege when discovered alone. Something known only by you, perhaps not easily shared. In these arid canyons, the agave has lived 25 years. It has never borne seed. Now it blooms, this one time only. Then it will die. The secret trail he takes should not be too secret. Someone should know his general vicinity in case there's trouble, in case he needs help, in case he surprises a rattlesnake. These canyons are arid. But sometimes there's a surprise, a hidden spring. Once again, exciting that sense of personal discovery, unexpectedly flowing right out of the limestone wall of the canyon. It's sweet, good, and cool. Where does the trail lead? Keep looking, follow it to the end. For some, this, too, is a part of a personal journey of discovery. Today, the trail ends at a drop of 500 feet, and below that, another precipice of 1,000 feet. In these spaces, a man may gain some perspective of his real significance in the universe, to experience something larger and greater than himself, something much larger. These same trails have been used for a thousand years. The Anasazi, the ancient ones, lived in and around the Grand Canyon long before the Spanish conquistadors came here in search of gold. Sometimes it seems you can still sense the spirit of these ancient ones here. If you linger in these quiet places, you may imagine that you even see their ghosts. There are over 2,000 sites where they left the remains of their buildings, or petroglyphs, the figures they carved on rock. They planted crops along the Colorado River, raising corn, squash, and beans. The pottery shards are plentiful, but reveal limited knowledge about these survivors. So we really don't know a great deal about them. Complicating our store of information is their puzzling disappearance from this entire region about 700 years ago. The growth rings of trees tell us there was a severe drought around that time, and many scientists speculate this would have destroyed their culture, always tenuous at best. But why they built facilities in inaccessible sites along the steep canyon walls is not known. These little houses are difficult to reach. Some may remain undiscovered.
Some ruins indicate that they lived in small groups of families and built surprisingly sophisticated housing. They built granaries for the processing and storage of food. One recent discovery is also a very significant find. It is called Shaman's Gallery. It contains an area of rock painting six feet high by 54 feet long. It is thought that these paintings predate the time of Christ, perhaps by as much as 2,000 years. There are more than 40 bizarre anthropomorphic figures. Its location has not been released. Because of the age and size of Shaman's Gallery, it is considered one of the most important recent finds in the Grand Canyon area. It must be protected until all its scientific knowledge has been mined. The ancients came to this spot to practice obscure rituals. At times, a mood of mysterious antiquity seems to linger here, yet. At times, you might see monsters here in the cliffs and canyons along the Colorado. Looking like some prehistoric reptile, the horned lizard is usually considered a desert creature. But the mountain horned lizard is in fact a forest dweller, a common one as it turns out. They are frequently seen on both rims of the Grand Canyon pursuing their own private interests searching the forest floor for ants. The ants are a staple for lizards and birds. In the summer, they swarm across the forest floor by the millions. People also swarm here by the millions. Along the rims in the summer, four million strong they come. Most have a brief look. steam locomotive arrived at Grand Canyon in 1901. It was the way to travel here then. Although Grand Canyon wasn't even a national park yet, people began to arrive by the thousands. The Atchison and Pacific Railroad had built a line across northern Arizona in the mid-1880s. Immediately, local interests began promoting the idea of a railroad to Grand Canyon. So at the turn of the century, the Santa Fe Company built a spur to Grand Canyon. It ran from Williams, Arizona, a distance of 100 miles. Now, one could reach the Grand Canyon in less than three hours from the main line. The rail line was challenged by the automobile almost immediately, but the Santa Fe continued to carry passengers until 1968. The era of the railroad seemed to be over. But now it's rolling again. Authentic steam locomotives, bringing visitors again. Passengers arrive at this log railway station, the only log railway station in the world, and only a few yards from the south rim of the canyon. Each passenger traveling in this way helps reduce auto traffic along the south rim. Consequently, 
the Park Service has cooperated with this revival of a historic old rail service. Immediately behind the old log station is the El Tavar Hotel, built in 1905, built by Santa Fe Railroad. The visitors they were bringing to the Grand Canyon needed a place to stay in style. It remains an elegant hotel. The myriad changing textures have always lured artists and photographers. Artist Thomas Moran came in 1873 to paint these same scenes. His work would help awaken a nation to the grandeur of the West. But still, people come to try their own hand, a human imperative shared with the ancient ones to capture the moment, to preserve a memory. Today, most of us exercise that artistic imperative with the ubiquitous camera. For some, it may simply offer a rationale for experiencing this place. It is a place that cannot be captured in photography. It refuses to completely yield its power and grandeur to the technology of a camera. To capture the essence, it should be experienced. Nature is not always just something pretty something benign. It can be harsh, even cruel, in human terms. And for some people, that sense of threat is a challenge, a stimulating, exhilarating challenge. In some places along the edge of the canyon, a strange world exists. As this plastic planet reforms and reshapes itself, the hidden world of slot canyons entices the intrepid photographer. These bizarre canyons are open to the sky, but often no sky is visible from their depths. It's a twilight world of strange forms and soft light. pull back to see the canyon, always returning to the rich textures. We contemplate the landscapes of another planet in the benign atmosphere of Earth. A walk through this forest, because of its isolation, may now present the same appearance as seen by an Anasazi Indian a thousand years ago. They began arriving about 1,200 years ago and found game plentiful here. Searching through the forest, they undoubtedly stalked the deer. When modern man entered this region, he coveted the deer as a target for his guns. In order to save the deer for himself, a systematic program of killing all predators was begun in the early part of this century, paid for by the government. By the 1920s, all wolves, bears, and most mountain lions were completely wiped out of northern Arizona. Without natural predators, the deer populations increased dramatically. There were so many deer that they ate all the available food. In a few years, the deer began to starve in massive die-offs. 
It took a decade for wildlife managers to understand what had happened. In trying to save the deer, they had almost destroyed them. Now they realized that the natural predators help keep the deer herds in balance with available food. The deer still have their fear of predators. They become agitated in the presence of a coyote, even though he's no threat to an adult. Wolves, which could take an adult deer, have not returned to the Kayabab Plateau. But a few mountain lion have, and their return is a benefit to the deer populations. rises from the canyon, collides with moist air flowing in from the Pacific. The moisture coalesces into vapor and becomes visible as clouds. in July and August. The monsoon season has arrived, as it's known here. The storms pile up, almost one on top of the other, as if they were crashing together in great aerial collisions. Clouds moving across the landscape create friction, which in turn produces static electricity. The clouds have become enormous containers of water, holding billions of gallons. Rain falls. It's difficult to overestimate the effects of the runoff on the canyon. It creates changes, even if almost imperceptible by human standards. This Grand Canyon is not timeless. There is only one constant here. That constant is change itself. It is continuous, persistent, and sometimes visible. The roiling waters carry grinding tools, sand, and stone. It gnaws at the surface, at the stream beds, at the lip of the canyon, at the belly of the canyon itself, cutting, slicing, eroding. The 10 million year process that formed this canyon is still an active, working force. Out in the desert, it's not even raining but distant clouds have poured billions of gallons of water on the surface of the land. More than the land can absorb. It's a flash flood. Now, it flows down the gentle inclines, making its way toward the canyon in places.
The passing storm has cleansed the air. To our human perceptions, even the ground seems strangely cleaner after the rain. Our spirits are refreshed. Sometimes we may share a rising exuberance with the reverberant frogs. In the western end of Grand Canyon, there is now enacted one of the strange mysteries of the desert southwest. On the bench lands near Toro Weep, we are 3,000 feet above the river. It is a remote, little visited area, unknown to most. Shallow depressions form small pools here on the edge of the canyon. They are filled with water only a few times each year during the monsoon rains. They are dry for months at a time. Yet, after the rains, life appears almost as if by magic in these temporary ponds called water pockets. The eggs of tiny frogs and shrimp have lain dormant, waiting for the rain. Now, tadpoles populate each of these water pockets. Like a prehistoric fossil returned to life, tadpole shrimp and tiny bivalves erupt into activity. Further to the west in the Mojave Desert, these bizarre shrimp have been known to reappear in places where it hadn't rained for 25 years. They now begin a race with time. The water pockets will last only a few days. The desert winds and the radiant sun evaporate the water level perceptibly day by day. As the last water vanishes, almost at the last moment it seems, the tiny tadpoles sprout legs. Songbirds, like the mockingbird, may become predatory. They feed on this unexpected bonanza of tadpoles. Finally, the newly formed frogs desperately deposit their eggs in the cracking mud, leaving the seeds of the next generation to perpetuate the flow of life, as they themselves lose their life to the heat and sun on the scorched bottom of yesterday's pond. Nearby, the desert tortoise searches for his morning meal. Racing along at about 20 feet per minute. He too, though a desert dweller, has a limited tolerance to heat. He can survive only a short time in 100 degrees. He may live most of his life without water. He's able to live on the moisture in the plants he eats. And plants are all he eats. He's strictly a vegetarian. The tarantula also has a low tolerance for heat. So as the day has grown warmer, he probably sees the shade of the tortoise as a place to escape the sun. This behavior seems to panic the tortoise. Since he can't back away fast enough, he just walks forward over the tarantula.
desperate for shade, the tarantula returns. In a surprising move, the tortoise becomes aggressive. A few nips, and the tarantula is convinced to look somewhere else for shade. Endangered now, the desert tortoise is protected by law. Apparently, he can survive nowhere else. Even if given the best of care, he always dies when taken from the desert. At the east end of Grand Canyon National Park, Lee's Ferry maintains a lonely presence along the Colorado River. In 1871, John Lee was sent here by the Mormon Church to begin a ferry service for the pioneers crossing the river to settle northern Arizona. A small fort was built for trade with the Navajo. Although it could be used for defense, it was never necessary. Across the river is Lee's backbone, as it was known then, a road built along this ridge so wagons could reach the river and ferry crossing, a road constructed by hand. Today, Lee's Ferry is the starting place for virtually all the float trips down the Colorado. Today, these river runners don't face the same unknowns that Major Powell did when he made the first run in 1869. But they still face the excitement and the thrills, and the hint of danger is still there. Major Powell and his crew saw the canyon as a mysterious foreboding place. But today's travelers view this same canyon as adventure, or perhaps even as a sanctuary the ponderous cliffs as their cathedral. They have come to experience the life of the canyon, even as their swelling numbers threaten it. The Anasazi also lived along the river corridor. Their cliffside buildings are thought to be granaries, a safe deposit for their precious food. They invite inspection from the daily passage of river runners. Many float trips pull in here at mile 33 when floating down from Lee's Ferry. A century ago, Major Powell camped here. The cave has a floor of smooth sand. It's like a huge band shell, 300 feet wide. The ceiling is 100 feet high. Powell estimated this cave would seat 50,000 people if it were used as some great theater. Even though the river is no longer an unknown, as it was in Major Powell's time, it's still a thrill. The danger is still real. Each passenger feels for a time that he has reclaimed the spirit of Major Powell, the spirit of adventure. Desert bighorn sheep see these floating craft and their human appendages every day. They seem unimpressed, but are wary. The sheep have specially padded hoops that allow them to grip steep rocky slopes. At Bass Camp, mile 107 as measured from Lee's Ferry, are the remains of early mining efforts 
and even a tourist camp. It has remained here ever since as a monument to countless pioneering attempts in the canyon. The humans often couldn't survive these rugged environs, but it's perfect for a scorpion. Even though poison, he's timid. Like almost all wildlife, he'd rather escape than fight. Some of the commercial float trips jam their passengers through the canyon in less than a week. There's little time to pause. But on those trips that are hand-powered, where the boats are usually rowed, the pace may be leisurely. There may be time to explore side canyons. Many of these clean streams emanate from springs back away from the main river. The deeply carved gorge tells us that the spring water has been at work here a long, long time. They feed more water into the turbulent Colorado. Because of Glen Canyon Dam on the northern border of Arizona, the river no longer flows as wild and free as in 1869. The dam has controlled the river since 1963. The water flows now when more electricity is needed in Los Angeles or Las Vegas. Before the dam, the river sometimes moved gravel and boulders as large as a house. The power is unimaginable until you're here sitting on top of it. In pre-dawn light, wranglers saddle mules. Sixty-five mules going down this morning. It takes the wranglers 45 minutes to saddle up. They sling leather with an ease that comes from practice. It's a 5.30 a.m. ritual for these cowboys, seven days a week. Get 
You make him stay right up close to the one in front of you. Ah, uh, mules go to eat, pull up on their heads. Don't let them eat that grass. The dust and things on there is what makes them cough, get sick, and die. That's when you have to get off and carry your meal back. If you have any questions, feel free to ask your guys. They don't know the answer. They'll make something up you might believe. All right. The mules move sedately, but steadily, plunging down into the canyon, dropping 3,000 feet in a couple of hours. are an accepted, even expected part of the Grand Canyon now. But they are not without controversy. They do contribute to a pungent aroma on the trails. The mules, however, make it possible for some people to experience the inner canyon who couldn't do it any other way. And it's usually these who are feeling the effects of the ride at the end of the day. This may be the most familiar animal face to most visitors. He's on all the trails of Grand Canyon. And even though his face is familiar, many people don't learn his name, Rock Squirrel. In spite of his name, he belongs to the family of tree squirrels. Rock squirrels are part of the rich diversity of life that help make Grand Canyon unique. Since he lives among the rocks, he's constantly alert for predators. The king snake is a resident of these desert regions. He needs to feed about once a month. Then his hunger propels him into action. He sometimes eats other snakes, even rattlesnakes. But he most commonly feeds on small rodents, like the cactus mouse. Their prolific rodents probably eat more grass than all the larger mammals here. These rodent populations are kept under control by snakes, hawks, coyotes, who often survive on them. He is a constrictor, holding and squeezing his prey so that it can't take in a breath of air. It dies of suffocation. The Kayabab squirrel, one of the rarest squirrels in North America, lives here on the north rim of Grand Canyon. He's found nowhere else in the world. That distinctive tail makes him unique. No other squirrel has a white tail. 
He is very similar to the Abert squirrel, which is found on the south side of Grand Canyon and throughout the mountain west. However, as the Colorado River cut deeper between the north and south rims for thousands of years, the two races were cut off from each other. And this squirrel developed into a separate subspecies, a classic example of evolution in progress. There now unfolds a transformation in the forests at the top of the Grand Canyon. One last moment of glory crowns the summer labors of the forest. They reflect an intensity in the flow of life, pulsating with the rhythms of the living planet itself. The days of Indian summer drift easily, slowly. They flood the forest with calm. They're inflamed now with new colors. The colors spill over into the canyon, but only in a few places. Mule deer have cleaned the velvet from fully developed antlers now. They fill their days with feeding, quietly. Still, the deer remain alert. Big cats are still here, though few in number. They are known by many names, panther, puma, catamount, mountain lion, cougar. Hated by ranchers for killing cattle, the cougar actually prefers to hunt deer. In this contest, it isn't just the deer trying to save its life. The cougar is also trying to save its life as well. later, it must make a successful kill or face starvation. The seasons change. They roll across these canyons irrevocably. Time presses on. The formations stand like timeless castles. They are, in fact, not timeless. This awesome, gorgeous splendor is only a passing moment in Earth's history. The days spin by. They have circled over these rock formations billions upon billions of times. Ultimately, the Grand Canyon may end as it began cut down by the very forces that created it. But in our time, this great national park offers life in astonishing fullness. It can remain a part of you for the rest of your life.